You Forever, written by Lab Sang Rampa, narrated by Clay Lumakayu. Author's Note I am Tuesday Lab Sang Rampa. That is my only name. It is now my legal name and I answer to no other. Many letters come to me with the weird conglomeration of names attached. They go straight in the waste paper basket for, as I say, my only name is Tuesday Lab Sang Rampa. All my books are true. All my claims are absolutely true. Years ago, the newspapers of England and Germany started a campaign against me at a time when I was not able to defend myself because I was almost dying from coronary thrombosis. I was persecuted without mercy insanely. Actually, a few people were jealous of me, and so they collected evidence. But it is significant that the collector of the evidence at no time tried to see me. It is unusual not to give an accused person a chance to state his own story. A person is innocent until proved guilty. I was never proved guilty, and never permitted to prove myself genuine. The newspapers of England and Germany would not give me any space in their columns, so I've been in the unfortunate position of knowing that I was innocent and truthful but unable to tell anyone my side of the story. One great television chain of stations offered me an interview, but they insisted that I say what they thought I should say. In other words, a lot of lies. I wanted to tell the truth, so they would not let me appear. Let me again state that everything that I have written is true. All my claims are true. My specific reason for insisting that all this is true is that in the near future, other people like me will appear. And I do not desire that they should have the suffering that I have had through spite and vicious hatred. A large number of people have seen my absolutely authentic papers, which prove that I have been a high lama of the Patala in Lhasa, Tibet, and that I am a qualified doctor of medicine trained in China. Although people have seen those papers, they forgot when the press came prying around. Will you, then, read my books, bearing in mind my positive assurance that the whole thing is true? I am what I claim to be. What am I? Read my books, and you will see. T. Labsang Rampa Forward This is a very special course of instruction for those who are sincerely interested in knowing the things which have to be known. At first it was intended that this should be in the form of a correspondence course, but then it was realized that, with all the organization necessary, each student would have to pay a fee of about thirty-five pounds for the course. So with the cooperation of my publishers, it was decided to produce it in book form. You will appreciate that normally in a correspondence course there would be certain questions which a student would want to ask, but I cannot undertake to answer questions arising from this book, because a poor wretched author does not make much out of books, you know. He makes very little indeed, and often an author will receive letters from all parts of the world, and the writers forget to include return postage. The author is then faced with the choice of paying himself or ignoring the letter. In my case, very foolishly, I have borne the cost of the printed paper, having the stuff type, paying the postage, etc., etc. But it makes all this too expensive, and so I am not at all prepared to answer any questions or letters, whatever, unless people bear that point in mind. You may be interested as a reader to hear this. I have had letters telling me that my books are too expensive, and would I send free copies? I had one letter from a person who said that my books were too expensive, and he asked me to send him an autographed copy of each of my books, and as an afterthought he added two other books by two other authors, and he asked me to give him those also. Yes, I did reply to his letter. I tell you, emphatically, that if you read this book, you will derive much benefit from it. If you study this book, you will derive much more benefit from it. To help you, you will find included the instructions which would have gone out with the correspondence course. 
Following this book, there will be another book containing monographs on various subjects of occult and everyday interest, and also containing a very special form of dictionary, an explanatory dictionary. And having tried to get such a book from various countries throughout the world, I decided to write one myself. I regard this second book as essential to the complete and most beneficial understanding of this, the first of the two. T. Lab Sang Rampa Instructions We, you, and us Agree, we are going to have to work together so that your psychic development may proceed apace. Some of these lessons will be longer and possibly more difficult than others. But these lessons are not padded. They contain, so far as we are able, real meat without fancy trimmings. Select a definite night each week on which to study this lesson work. Get into the habit of studying at a certain time, at a certain place, at a certain day. There is more to it than just reading words because you have to absorb ideas which may be very strange to you, and the mental discipline of regular habits will assist you enormously. Have some place, some room set aside where you can be comfortable. You will learn more easily if you are comfortable. Lie down, if you prefer, but in any case adopt an attitude where there is no strain upon muscles where you can relax so that the whole of your attention may be given to the printed words and the thoughts behind them. If you are tensed up, much of your awareness is devoted to sensing the feeling of tenseness. You want to make sure that for an hour or two hours, or however long it takes you to read the lesson work, no one will intrude upon you and break your trend of thoughts. In your room, in your study, shut the door. Lock it for preference and draw close the blinds so that the fluctuations of daylight do not distract your attention. Have just one light on in the room, and that should be a reading lamp placed slightly behind you. This will provide adequate illumination while leaving the rest of the room in suitable shade. Lie down, or adopt any position which is quite comfortable and restful. Relax for a few moments. Let yourself breathe deeply. That is, take perhaps three really deep breaths, one after the other. Hold your breath for three or four seconds, then let it out over a period of three or four seconds. Rest quiet for a few more seconds, and then pick up the lesson work and read it. First read it easily. Just work through it as if you were reading a newspaper. When you have done that, Pause for a few moments to let what you have so lightly read sink into your subconscious. Then start all over again. Go through the lesson work meticulously, paragraph by paragraph. If anything puzzles you, make a note of it. Write it down on a conveniently placed notebook. Do not try to memorize anything. There is no point in being a slave to the printed word. The whole purpose of lesson work such as this is to sink into your subconscious. A conscious attempt to memorize often blinds one to the full meaning of the words. You are not entering into an examination where parrot-like repetition of certain phrases is all that is required. You are, instead, storing up knowledge which can set you free from the bonds of the flesh and enable you to see what manner of thing this human body is, and determine the purpose of life on earth. When you have gone through the lesson work again, consult your notes and ponder over the points which puzzle you, the points which are not clear to you. It is too easy to just write in to us and have a question answered. That will not cause it to sink into your subconscious. It is kinder and better for you that you should think of the answer yourself. You must do your part. Anything that is worth having is worth working for. Things which are given away free are usually so given because they are not worth charging for. You must open your mind. You must be willing to absorb new knowledge. You must imagine that knowledge is flowing into you. Remember, as a man thinketh, so is he. Lesson 1. 
Before we attempt to understand the nature of the overself or deal with any occult matter, we must be sure that first we comprehend the nature of man. In this course, we shall use the term man to indicate man and woman. Let us at the outset state definitely that woman is at least the equal of man in all matters relating to the occult and extrasensory perceptions. Woman, in fact, often has a brighter aura and a greater capacity for appreciation of the various facets of metaphysics. What is life? Actually, everything that exists is life. Even a creature which we normally term dead is alive. The normal form of its life may have ceased, as it would have done for us to term it dead. But with the cessation of that life, a fresh form of life took over. The process of dissolution creates life of its own. Everything that is vibrates. Everything consists of molecules in constant motion. We will use molecules instead of atoms, neutrons, protons, etc. Because this is a course on metaphysics, not a course of chemistry or physics. We are trying to paint a general picture rather than go into microscopic detail on irrelevant matters. Perhaps we should say a few words about molecules and atoms first in order to appease the purist who otherwise would write in and give us knowledge which we already possess. Molecules are very small, very small, but they can be seen by the use of the electron microscope and by those who are trained in metaphysical arts. According to the dictionary, a molecule is the smallest portion of a substance capable of independent existence while retaining the properties of that substance. Small though molecules are, they are composed of even smaller particles known as atoms. An atom is like a miniature solar system. The nucleus of the atom represents the sun in our own solar system. Around this sun rotate electrons in much the same way as our solar system planets revolve around our sun. As in the solar system, the atom unit is mostly empty space. Here, in figure one, is how the carbon atom, the brick of our own universe, appears when greatly magnified. Figure two shows our solar system. Every substance has a different number of electrons around its nucleus, sun. Uranium, for example, has 92 electrons. Carbon has only six. Two close to the nucleus, and four orbiting at a greater distance. But we are going to forget about atoms and refer only to molecules. Man is a mass of rapidly rotating molecules. Man appears to be solid. It is not easy to push a finger through bone and flesh. Yet this solidity is an illusion forced upon us because we too are mankind. Consider a creature of infinite smallness who can stand at a distance from a human body and look at it. The creature would see whirling suns, spiral nebulae, and streams akin to the Milky Way. In the soft parts of the body, the flesh, the molecules would be widely dispersed. In the hard substances, the bones, the molecules would be dense, bunched together and giving the appearance of a great cluster of stars. Imagine yourself standing on the top of a mountain on some clear night. You are alone, far from the lights of any city which, reflecting into the night sky, causes refraction from suspended moisture drops and makes the heavens appear dim. This is why observatories are always built in remote districts. You are on your own mountain top. Above you the stars shine clear and brilliant. You gaze at them as they wheel in endless array before your wandering eyes. Great galaxies stretch before you. Clusters of stars adorn the blackness of the night sky. Across the heavens, the band known as the Milky Way appears as a vast and smoky trail. Stars, worlds, planets, molecules. So would the microscopic creature see you. The stars in the heavens above appear as points of light with incredible spaces between them. Billions, trillions of stars there are, 
yet compared to the great empty space they seem few indeed. Even a spaceship one could move between stars without touching any. Supposing you could close up the spaces between the stars, the molecules, what would you see? That microscopic creature who is viewing you from afar? Is he, it, wondering that also? We know that all those molecules which the creature sees is us. What, then, is the final shape of the star formations in the heavens? Each man is a universe, a universe in which planets, molecules, spin around a central sun. Every rock, twig, or drop of water is composed of molecules in constant, unending motion. Man is composed of molecules in motion. That motion generates a form of electricity, which uniting with the electricity delivered by the over-self gives sentient life. Around the poles of the earth, magnetic storms flare and glow, giving rise to the aurora borealis, with all its colored lights. Around all planets and molecules, magnetic radiations interplay and interact with other radiations emanating from nearby worlds and molecules. No man is a world unto himself. No world or molecules can exist without other worlds or molecules. Every creature, world, or molecule depends upon the existence of other creatures, worlds, or molecules, that its own existence may continue. It must also be appreciated that molecule groups are of different densities. They are, in fact, like clusters of stars swinging in space. In some parts of the universe there are areas populated by very few stars or planets or worlds, whichever you like to call them. But elsewhere there is a considerable density of planets, as, for example, in the Milky Way. In much the same manner rock can represent a very dense constellation or galaxy. Air is much more thinly populated by molecules. Air, in fact, goes through us and actually passes through the capillaries of our lungs and into our bloodstream. Beyond there, there is space, where there are clusters of hydrogen molecules widely dispersed. Space is not emptiness as people used to imagine, but is a collection of wildly oscillating hydrogen molecules and, of course, the stars and planets and worlds formed from the hydrogen molecules. It is clear that if one has a substantial collection of molecular groups, then it is quite a difficult matter for any other creature to pass through the groups. But a so-called ghost, which has its molecules widely spaced, can easily pass through a brick wall. Think of the brick wall as it is, a collection of molecules something like a cloud of dust in suspension in the air. Improbable though it may seem, there is space between every molecule, just as there is space between different stars. And if some of the creatures were small enough, or if their molecules were dispersed enough, then they could pass between the molecules of, say, a brick wall, without touching any. This enables us to appreciate how a ghost can appear within a closed room, and how it can walk through a seemingly solid wall. Everything is relative. A wall which is solid to you, may not be solid to a ghost or to a creature from the astral, but we shall deal with such things later. Lesson 2 The human body is, of course, a collection of molecules as we have just seen, and while a very minute creature, such as a virus, would see us as a collection of molecules, we have to regard the human being now as a collection of chemicals as well. A human being consists of many chemicals. The human body also consists mainly of water. If you think that contradicts anything in the last lesson, remember that even water consists of molecules. And it is indeed a fact that if you could teach a virus to speak, it would undoubtedly tell you that it saw water molecules clashing around each other, like pebbles on a beach. And even smaller creature would say that the molecules of air reminded of sand on the seashore. But now we are concerned more with the chemistry of the body. 
If you go to a shop and you buy a battery for your flash lamp, you get a container with a zinc case and a carbon electrode in the center, a piece of carbon perhaps as thick as a pencil, and a collection of chemicals packed tightly between the outer zinc case and the central carbon rod. The whole affair is quite moist inside. Outside, of course, it is dry. You put this battery in your flash lamp, and when you operate the switch, you get a light. Do you know why? Under certain conditions, metals and carbon and chemicals react together chemically in order to produce something which we call electricity. This zinc container, with its chemicals and its carbon rod, generate electricity. But there is no electricity within the flash lamp battery. It is instead merely a collection of chemicals ready to do its work under certain conditions. Many people have heard that boats and ships of all kinds generate electricity by just being in salt water. For instance, under certain conditions, a boat or ship, which is even resting idly in the sea, can generate an electric current between adjacent dissimilar metal plates. Unfortunately, if a ship has, for instance, a copper bottom connected to iron upper works, then unless special arrangements were made, electrolysis, the generation of electric current, would eat away the junction between the two dissimilar metals, that is, the iron and the copper. Of course, it never actually happens now, for it can be prevented by using what one terms a sacrificial anode, a piece of metal such as zinc, aluminum, or magnesium, is positive compared to other common metals such as copper or bronze. Bronze, as you know, is often used for making ships' propellers. Now, if the sacrificial anode is fastened to the ship or boat below the water line somewhere and is connected to other submerged metal parts, the sacrificial metal will corrode and waste away and it will prevent the hull of the ship or the propellers from wasting away. As this metal piece corrodes, it can be replaced. That is just an ordinary part of ship maintenance, and all this is mentioned just to give you an idea of how electricity can be and is generated in the most unusual ways. The brain generates electricity of its own. Within the human body, there are traces of metals, even metals such as zinc. And of course, we must remember that the human body has the carbon molecule as its basis. There is much water in the body, and traces of chemicals such as magnesium, potassium, etc. These combine to form an electric current, a minute one, but one which can be detected, measured, and charted. A person who is mentally ill can, by the use of a certain instrument, have his brain waves charted. Various electrodes are placed upon his head, and little pens go to work on a strip of paper. As the patient thinks of certain things, the pens draw four squiggly lines, which can be interpreted to indicate the type of illness from which the patient is suffering. Instruments such as this are in common use in all mental hospitals. The brain is, of course, a form of receiving station for the messages which are transmitted by the overself and the human brain in its turn can transmit messages, such as lessons learned, experiences gained, etc., to the over-self. These messages are conveyed by means of the silver cord, a mass of high-velocity molecules which vibrate and rotate at an extremely divergent range of frequencies and connects the human body and the human over-self. The body here on Earth is something like a vehicle operating by remote control. The driver is the over-self. You may have seen a child's toy car, which is connected to the child by a long, flexible cable. The child can press a button and make the car go forward, or make it stop, or go back. And by turning a wheel on this flexible cable, the car can be steered. The human body may be likened very, very roughly to that, for the over-self which cannot come down to the earth to gain experiences sends down this body which is us on earth. Everything that we experience, everything that we do or think or hear, travels upwards to be stored in the memory of the over-self. Very highly intelligent men who get inspiration 
often obtain a message directly, consciously, from the overself by way of the silver cord. Leonardo da Vinci was one of those who was most constantly in touch with his overself, and so he is rated as a genius in almost everything that he did. Great artists or great musicians are those in touch with their overself on perhaps one or two particular lines, and so they come back and compose by inspiration music or paintings which have been more or less dictated to them by the greater powers which control us. This silver cord connects us to our overself in much the same way as the umbilical cord connects a baby to its mother. The umbilical cord is a very intricate device, a very complex affair indeed, but it is as a piece of string compared to the complexity of the silver cord. This cord is a mass of molecules rotating over an extremely wide range of frequencies. But it is an intangible thing so far as the human body on Earth is concerned. The molecules are too widely dispersed for the average human sight to see it. Many animals can see it because animals see on a different range of frequencies and hear on a different range of frequencies than humans. Dogs, as you know, can be called by a silent dog whistle. Silent because a human cannot hear it, but a dog easily can. In the same way, animals can see the silver cord and the aura, because both these vibrate on a frequency which is just within the receptivity of an animal's sight. With practice, it is quite easily possible for a human to extend the band of receptivity of their sight in much the same way as a weak man, by practice and by exercise can lift a weight which normally would be far, far beyond his physical capabilities. The silver cord is a mass of molecules, a mass of vibrations. One can liken it to the tight beam of radio waves which scientists bounce off the moon. Scientists trying to measure the distance of the moon broadcast on a very narrow beam a wave form to the surface of the moon. That is much the same as the silver cord between the human body and the human overself. It is the method whereby the overself communicates with the body on earth. Everything we do is known to the overself. People strive to become spiritual if they are on the right path. Basically, in striving for spirituality, they strive to increase their own rate of vibration on earth, and by way of the silver cord to increase the rate of vibration of the overself. The overself sends down a part of itself into a human body in order that lessons may be learned and experiences gained. Every good deed we do increases our earth and our astral rate of vibration. But if we do an evil deed to some person, that, that decreases and subtracts from our rate of spiritual vibration. Thus, when we do an ill turn to another, we put ourselves at least one step down on the ladder of evolution and every good deed we do increases our own personal vibration by a like amount. Thus it is that it is so essential to adhere to the old Buddhist formula, which exhorts one to return good for evil, and to fear no man, and to fear no man's deed, for in returning good for evil, and giving good at all times, we progress upwards and never downwards. Everyone knows of a person who is a low sort of fellow. Some of our metaphysical knowledge leaks over into common usage in much the same way as we say a person is in a black mood or a blue mood. It is all a matter of vibration, all a matter of what the body transmits by way of the silver cord to the overself, and what the overself sends back again by way of the silver cord to the body. Many people cannot understand their inability to consciously contact their overself. It is quite a difficult matter without long training. Supposing you are in South America, and you want to telephone someone in Russia, perhaps in Siberia. First of all, you have to make sure that there is a telephone line available. Then you have to take into consideration the difference in time between the two countries. Next, you have to make sure that the person you want to telephone is available and can speak your language. And after all that, you have to see if the authorities will permit of such a telephone message. It is better at this stage of evolution not to bother too much about trying to contact one's overself consciously, because no course, no information will give you, in a few written pages, 
what it might take ten years of practice to accomplish. Most people expect too much. They expect that they can read a course and immediately go and do everything that the masters do. And the masters may have studied a lifetime, and many lifetimes before that. Read this course, study it, ponder upon it, and if you will open your mind, you may be granted enlightenment. We have known many cases where people, most often women, received certain information, and they then could actually see the etheric or the aura of the silver cord. We have had many experiences to fortify us in our statement that you, too, can do this, if you will permit yourself to believe.